Greetings. Welcome to the Avon Valley Churches. This area is peaceful and beautiful. We're greatly blessed to live here on the edge of the New Forest where Hampshire meets Wiltshire and Dorset. My name is Jeremy and in this Thought for the Day let us consider Mark, the Gospel writer. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John bless the bed I lie upon. Do you remember that children's bedtime prayer? It calls to mind the four evangelists. And that's the order that they appear in the Bible. But scholars have since worked out that Mark was the first written and the others all had read Mark's Gospel some years before theirs were finalised. So we can spot his influence in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. So today let's consider the life of Mark a well-educated young man who knew Jesus personally and eventually gave up his life for him. Just as some people confuse the several Marys in the New Testament, so some also think that the references to Mark belong to different people, all called Mark. However, I follow the unbroken Christian tradition and believe that the references to Mark all apply to the Gospel writer. Mark is sometimes called John Mark in the Bible. Mark's father, Aristopolis, and his mother, Mary, once lived in Libya in a town called Cyrene. Particularly since the Roman occupation, many Jewish families had dispersed around the Mediterranean. Mark's father was an elder of the Jewish faith. He was also successful in business and he had a nice house. We don't know if Mark had any brothers or sisters, but in the Fordingbridge Passion Play, we met his sister as the narrator setting the scenes. It's suggested that Mark was born in the year AD 5, or maybe a few years later. In Cyrene, the Jewish people were victimised by certain rough elements of the community, and one day Mark's family home was attacked and damaged. They decided to move to Jerusalem and in that city they bought a large house with a good sized meeting room upstairs. But more of that room later. It seems that Mark's father Aristopolis had a friend, Nicodemus. This man was highly esteemed and was a member of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, which was dominated by the chief priest and his relations. Later, Nicodemus met Jesus and spoke up for him. Mark's mother Mary was given an unusual degree of responsibility and freedom to run the home and to follow her own interests. Mary heard tell of John the Baptist and with Mark as her male escort, they had been down to the Jordan Valley, heard John and then been baptised along with many others. Later, Mary, with the encouragement of her brother Barnabas, more of him later, whenever Jesus ventured south from Galilee into Judea, she and Mark would go and listen to him. Maybe Mark also journeyed up to Galilee and listened to Jesus. Perhaps he was present when Peter said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Mark's Gospel carries that theme. Mark and his mother Mary also got to know local friends of Jesus's, including in Bethany, Martha, Lazarus and Mary, that is Mary of Bethany. To save confusion, these new Bethany friends called Mark's mother Mary of Jerusalem. Thus it was that a few days after Jesus had made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus asked Lazarus to find a suitable room in Jerusalem for the closest disciples to celebrate the Passover. Lazarus contacted Mary of Jerusalem and it was all arranged. At the agreed time Mary sent a male servant or maybe it was Mark himself with a water pitcher on his shoulder to stand just inside the city gate on the road from the Mount of Olives. The advance guard of the disciples easily spotted a man carrying water and he led them to the house where Mary welcomed them and showed them the upper room. There they liaised over the preparation and provisions of the Passover meal for Jesus and his friends. Mark was fascinated by this great occasion in his own home. 
Although not included, there was an upper gallery where he could secretly watch and listen to the Last Supper. He was witness to it all. But it was hot up there in the gallery and he stripped down to just his tunic to keep cool. When Jesus and the apostles departed, he grabbed a cloak and followed them to the Garden of Gethsemane. There, secretly watching, Mark heard and saw it all. This part of the Garden of Gethsemane is now private within a locked walled area. When we were last on pilgrimage there, Canon Michael was able to arrange for our group to be shut into that walled area for a while, so we had peace to meditate and pray in that special place. To return to the historic events, Mark was aghast when the Apostle Judas led some high temple guards and a posse of the high priest's staff accompanied by a rabble into the garden. Mark saw Jesus arrested and saw the apostles all slipping discreetly away. Jesus was speaking quietly to his captors. Mark edged forward through the bushes to hear better. Then a guard spotted him. There's one, he shouted, and lunging at Mark, grabbed his tunic. Mark squirmed out of it and escaped naked back into the bushes. After they were all gone, he returned and found his cloak, so he could then get home. No one knew of this little incident except Mark himself, and he recorded it in the gospel that he later wrote. When he got home, he found some of the disciples assembled there. They were now really frightened, as it was quite common, if there was a perceived troublemaker arrested, to gather his followers and make an example of the lot of them. However, they knew that they were safe in such a distinguished house. Some, very discreetly, were keeping watch on where Jesus was held, and when he was moved, they even infiltrated the crowd into the courtyard of Pontius Pilate and followed proceedings throughout. The awful news reached them that the chief priests wanted Jesus to be put to death. Meanwhile, a friend, a Jewish friend of Mark's family from their old home in Libya, Simon of Cyrene with his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, was coming to visit them for the Passover. It was he who came across Jesus, so weakened by flogging that he was staggering under the crossbar that he had to carry. Simon carried it for him up to Calvary. It was there that Mark, hid, half hidden by a cloak, pulled up over his head, came across Simon and his sons. He explained the ghastly event. Mark's mother, Mary of Jerusalem, was there with Mary Magdalene and other lady disciples. They were gathered in Jesus' view, so that he should know that his friends were there for him and praying for him as he died. On the third day, Mark was there at home when the amazing, wonderful news of the resurrection was brought to them. It was there that Jesus appeared to his friends. But Thomas was not there and quite reasonably doubted what seemed impossible. Then Jesus came again. Thomas was there. He declared the immortal words, my Lord and my God. For a while the apostles returned to Galilee and met the risen Christ there. Then they came back to Jerusalem and finally from the Mount of Olives near Bethany, Jesus ascended to heaven. With the blessing of Mark's parents, the disciples retained the upper room as their base in Jerusalem. So it was the first Christian church for well, this time, Mary of Nazareth, the mother of Jesus, and two of Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, had joined the disciples. It was at Pentecost that the apostles were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered them as preachers, healers and missionaries. Over the next few years, there are various references to Mark with the disciples. At one point, Peter was arrested and imprisoned by a miracle or as he put it, by an angel, he escaped. He immediately took refuge in Mark's family home. Thus we know that Peter was by now a close friend of that family. Peter took the good news of Jesus far and wide, including to the Gentiles. 
and at least some of these journeys Mark accompanied him. We believe that Mark, with his good education, noted down all of Peter's sermons and memories of his life with Jesus. Thus, much of Mark's Gospel is based on the memories and reflections of Peter. Mark also travelled with his uncle Barnabas. Sometimes they were with Paul on his missionary journeys and sometimes separately. At one point, Paul and Barnabas had a spat over whether Mark should go with them. They agreed to differ. Paul took Silas instead and Mark and Barnabas went off by sea to Cyprus. Later, Paul clearly esteemed Mark greatly and Mark spent much time with him. When in prison in Rome, Paul asked if Mark could come to him. So Mark came to understand Paul's Christian message to those not of the Jewish religion, i.e. the Gentiles. And this influenced how Mark styled his gospel. It is believed that both Paul and Peter were executed in Rome in the purge of Christians by the Emperor Nero after the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. James, the leader of the Christians in Jerusalem, had been martyred two years earlier. So the three leading Christian voices were now silenced. Thus there was a great need for a reliable Christian written account as a reference for all Christians. So Mark launched his gospel, possibly in about 65 AD. As soon as the news spread, every Christian church or gathering all around the Mediterranean would have required a copy. Those Christian scribes must have been busy under great pressure as they scripted copy after copy of Mark's gospel. In AD 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and so those leaders of Christianity were dispersed. It created an even greater need for Mark's authoritative written record. The number of those who personally could vouch for the accuracy of the Christian message were diminishing, yet the need was growing. Also, letters and leaders were appearing with false teachings. Mark's Gospel was particularly important in those critical years of the young Christian church. Mark had also been busy on his own agenda. In addition to his mission journeys with Peter and Paul, he had been a missionary in his own right. He took Christianity to Africa. He had several times visited Alexandria in Egypt. There he founded a Christian church and became its first bishop. This initiative led to the present Coptic Church, which recognises Mark as its founder, just as Peter has been recognised as the founder of the Roman Catholic Church. Sadly, Pagans murdered Mark in Alexandria, possibly in the year 68 AD. Mark was a loyal disciple to Jesus. He was part host to the first Christian church and he was a fearless pioneering missionary. His gospel is the shortest and most dramatic. It's focused on Jesus, that he is the Messiah, God's promised one. This was the only gospel for many critical years. Along with Peter and Paul, we owe so much to Mark. We can recognise him as a primary pillar of our faith. Maybe the importance of Mark is sometimes overlooked. Thank you, Mark. We salute you. And thank you for joining me in this thought for the day. May God be with you. Goodbye.